Nowadays, if you look online, everyone has some course to sell. Yeah. The total amount of student loan debt in the United States is like $1.6 trillion now. What's next in the journey? You're hiring folks from UF, stuff is working, and is everything at this point still inbound? But that was the first big aha moment for beyond just making a good bit. When do you graduate from co-working space to the next office space? The goal was to cut it down to just those that would get the most value out of us. I think on the other side, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The one that went absolutely viral online, it's got a couple million views on Instagram. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on John. John was the founder of Hyperlinks Media, which was a digital PR agency and owned a bunch of online publications. You exited that business a couple years ago. You now own a baby shark, and you're also the organizer of Tiny Talks in Austin. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. One thing I like asking every guest is, where do you think your entrepreneurial journey started? It started in high school when i got my first job my neighbor hired her son and her son's friends to figure out how to get traffic to their her website and through that she just paid me to read books on seo and digital marketing so through that experience got really into it and then i started like my own blog about a few months later and from there just from people like reading my article ideas uh basically is just what made me realize that people would actually pay me to do something outside of my job. So yeah, a job in high school. <laughs> when were you reading? What Around what year was this? This was yeah. 2011. Okay, so still relatively early from like a SEO point of view. Like I, in, in my understanding, SEO hadn't like become such a commoditized thing then. Yeah, it's it's definitely changed a bit. There's, I mean, it's interesting when I go to conferences, there'd be like OGs that'd be doing it since like when Google first started. Yeah. But generally speaking, I mean, I still think it was still like the early days. Okay. Yeah. So you ended up doing SEO, writing a blog. When did that turn into a business for you? Yeah. As I was applying for colleges and getting rejected by a bunch of Ivy League schools, I was also getting job offers from different startups to come work in-house. But there's also companies that were just like, what can we pay you to do as a consultant? So I didn't really lead with trying to offer services. I was just like enjoying like sharing my ideas with the world. But basically, as people just started hitting me up saying, how much can I pay you to do this for me? Then it became, oh, crap. OK, this could actually be a business. So okay. it kind of happened organically like that. And it was very it was all inbound like you never really put it out there like, oh, buy, like, buy this SEO service. It was all organic inbound. It was all it was all organic inbound. And then later that year, when I was a freshman at the University of Florida, I had a big enough audience where I thought I could launch some kind of a educational product. So out of my dorm room, uh, one morning, I, I, I sent out the email to everybody that subscribed that I had like a link building course that people could purchase. And so... Yeah, on that day, I think I pulled in like $3,000, which it was like months of work. So if you really averaged out per hour, it wasn't that much money. Yeah. But that was the first big aha moment for beyond just making a good bit hourly. I think it was making like 40, 50 bucks hourly is what I was charging at the time. So started off with, yeah, the hourly work, then, then the course, a lot of good response. And then eventually decided like I could actually like hire people underneath me to do this work for other people as well. So... And you're still in college at this point. I was still in college, losing losing interest by the day. In... Did you follow through and get your degree or no? No, 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 no. I dropped out a few years in. I took like a semester off at one point. And the big reason I dropped out was because like I missed an exam because I had, there was this uh, car sharing company in San Francisco, Ashton Kutcher, that invested in, I forget the name, they, they, didn't, they didn't last, but... They hit me up to do like a project over a weekend and it was like the same weekend as like the exam and i was like well they're gonna pay me like five or six grand to do this i'll just retake this exam and then that actually flunked me out of the business school they wouldn't let me back in for 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 one grade that wasn't an a and uh and from there i just lost yeah, total interest yeah. yeah yeah that's nice uh, uh quick sidetrack if uh, if you've launched a course recently there's so many tools, there's Kajabi, there's all these platforms that allow you to 
make launching a course super easy. Mm -hmm. But when you launched it, what was your go-to method of getting the videos out there, recording them, putting them online? Was it just you put stuff together or did something exist? It was just a WordPress website. Okay. It was a WordPress website with like a paid login feature. Okay. So I didn't use any of those course things. I also didn't do video. So back then I just it did like just text. text. Okay. I made this one giant Google doc of like link building opportunities. So it was a little interactive and a little bit more resource driven. But yeah, that was, that was 2012 when the course came out. So um, the reason I ask is Nowadays, if you look online, everyone has some course to sell yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's the the barrier to entry to build a course nowadays is nothing, right? But having that foresight of doing it uh, ten years ago, ten plus years ago, it just highlights understanding audience, understanding who you where you have distribution, understanding what they need, right? Um, yeah. But I like that picture. Yeah, those early days, I was the I was the most I did things for like all the right reasons in the sense that I was like, okay, enough people hit me up saying, do you have something more and more in depth? And then I was like, okay, I guess I'll build something. You know, I, the ideal entrepreneur journey is you see a need and you yeah, just create yeah. something for it. But back then it was literally just that as a, as a 19 year old kid. Nice. Uh, and so you do the car sharing gig, you don't have college to go back to, what's your next step? So it was letting other people do work under my name. So it was like my sophomore year of college when I made my first hire. And I believe my first hire is this woman named Lee. She was another UF student. And it was just figuring out how to be okay with that. I mean, I feel like that's the first, I think it's one of the biggest hurdles that entrepreneurs face in general is just letting someone else do something. Yeah. So that was the first big step. And then I, befriended somebody who hired me to do some link building consultants. He ended up sharing way more knowledge than, than I was giving him in this call. And then we became really good friends. Uh, he lives in Australia and I went to visit him and he runs this big, he, he did ran this big digital marketing agency out of the Philippines. And he, one of the biggest turning points in my entrepreneurial journey was what he showed me in terms of standardized processes, standardized documentation. SOP, yeah. Yes, SOPs, exactly. So through him, I became like super into SOPs, it built out a ton of SOPs, like figured out how to do every little detail and document it well. And then that's how I went from like one to 20 different fellow college students working for me over the course of the next like 18 months. Okay, So, and are you still living on campus, living outside campus? like? Yeah, I was at, I was living off campus then, and I had an office that was like six minutes away from campus. So, I think a couple employees would just like bike to nice. the office, and yeah, it was a super sweet, like basically co working space where I just took over like two thirds of the space, and uh, and yeah, that was. Did you know anything about ten ninety nines issuing payroll benefits? Because I don't like. I mean, you're just. You just started hired people you knew and your friends, right? But when did it become, a, oh, I need to figure this part of owning a business and agency as well? Yeah, yeah. There was a woman who came in to the business school to do like a little talk and she was an accountant and a bookkeeper. And I was like, I have, I'm trying to make my first few hires and I literally just hired her and I still work with her to this day. Nice. Uh, her name's Stephanie. And so she helped me with all those different documents and stuff. So honestly, it was just like, Ear to the grounds as a college kid, like anytime I hear anything that like could potentially help me, just like chasing it. I'm way less that these days, but back then, yeah, it was like the first person I came across that knew what that stuff was and just hired her, so. Why go to folks at UF versus higher perf, like folks in the industry versus offshore onshore? Cause you'd seen this operation in Australia. Yeah. Why did you make that decision to? Uh, I don't, I don't think there was a ton of thinking involved. I wasn't, uh, I, there was definitely at certain points we've, I've been off and on with hiring people in the Philippines. I feel like it was the best English speaking skills yeah. and also new under follow directions. Yeah. I can communicate clearly. And there's cultural aspects of the Philippines that isn't great. A lot of people like flaked out and if they didn't know how to do something, they would just ghost. It was like a very weird culture in that way. But generally speaking, yeah, at one point I had Two thirds of the team was offshores. So I think after a couple hires, I think I hired four or five people in the Philippines, realized that those, for the operation that I had, I think the core 
skill-based outreach people that would do all the email outreach that our agency was doing needed to be in the US. And then we would have, we would supplement with VAs and offshore people nice. to help them just give them review websites, do more of the manual parts, and then the more creative communication parts we would keep in the US. So a little bit trial and error, but generally speaking, yeah, like uh, at our height, we had 20 people in, in our office. And then we had, I think, probably four or five people in the Philippines that were just helping feed them, nice. feed them data. When do you tra uh, graduate from co-working space to the next office space? Because you've been, you ran the business for 12 plus years, right? 13 plus years. Yeah. So what's next in the journey? You're hiring folks from UF, stuff is working, and is everything at this point still inbound? Have you created an outbound sales motion or is this still all referral based? Inbound? Everything's inbound, everything's referral. It was a really good space to be in to where like, if you did good work, like you would get way more business than you can handle. Okay. Because it was something to where it made a big difference for a lot of SEO campaigns for a lot of big websites. Like the on-site stuff and the content stuff was generally pretty straightforward and people like to do those parts. People hated the link building and link building was what like separated the good from the great. And, but yeah, nobody wanted to do it. So if we could do it well, that business owner would tell like four or five mm -hmm. others. So we never had to do outbounds. The big turning point was when we had 20 people in the office and we had what looked like a hugely successful operation. Profitably, it wasn't. So I remember like we would do, I think our margin was probably like 15, 20% at our heights yeah. in terms of staff. And then over the next 12 to 18 months, went to all of our clients, doubled our prices and cut our team by like two thirds. And we were making like three times more money. So the big next change was actually scaling back. Yeah. I, we kind of grew too much and took on everything, tried to compete on price on stuff. And then I was like, no, let's not do that. Now I lost like half our clients through that whole process, but like that was, that was actually the goal. The goal was to cut it down to just those that would get the most value out of us. So yeah, it was peak office, scaling back, and then over the next few years, like hired remote. And that was the sort of the next step. Nice. Yeah. Uh, w what gave you that maturity to look at this and be like, hey, I need to change something? So I think it's like easy to, to say that like people should charge more. I think it's easy to say like fire your bad clients, but like, the easiest way to actually get to that point in a way that doesn't feel hard is just have more work than you can take on. Like if you can only do work for eight clients, but you basically have 12, then cutting your your bad four, it's easy because you can only do eight. So it was, it was the natural step once we had gotten to a point where I'm like, okay, we could scale this thing a lot higher, but we already have more work than we can handle. And, and from there it was just scaling back. So it was just kind of the natural next step. Even though like I, it still took advice from the right people to be like, you don't want all work, not all work is good. But it was much easier to do that versus somebody starting out that has like very few clients and you're trying to tell them that they should be firing their bad clients and like not taking on these things. Easier said than done when you're just trying to pay your bills and get through like the month. But at that stage that we were at, it was a lot easier because we had plenty of people that would line up to replace those ones that didn't play ball in terms of higher price or just not being a pain in the ass. <laughs> and I, I think it get, takes a certain point for folks to get to that level. I feel like when folks are starting out agencies or service-based businesses, it's very hard to say no to someone writing you a check, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a customer, when you have someone willing to pay you, I think it becomes really hard to be like, oh no, I don't want your money because of whatever reason. Yeah. And you have to go through circle cycles and get to that point where you understand that, okay, not every client's a good client. Yeah. But I feel like everyone I know who starts out will take on any client until they start figuring stuff out. Totally, bit. and I think it's good. I actually think it's the right first step. <laughs> yeah. You should take on everything in your eyes that seems good because you can't start to decide what is the key characteristics of a good client versus a bad client, things that are profitable versus not, things that are taking up a lot more time and resources than you realize than not. So I don't actually like, when I talk to other people that are in earlier stages, like don't be selective early on. Cause like you'll just learn naturally and you need that homework 
before you can start to decide what are the kinds of clients you should really be going for and trying to really stack? I'm, I'm sort of diverging based off of your journey, but uh, you said do everything that comes your way within your forte. You guys were doing a lot of link building SEO stuff. Yep. What do you think about as an agency owner having a skill set, but also niching down on an industry versus just having that skill set and doing it for anyone who comes to your door? Biggest recommendation I have for people starting out is the only way to cut through at the beginning is to be niche. So like, even if you have a goal to be super broad, even if you have a goal to be like an all encompassing, you know, digital strategy agency or marketing agency or anything, like there's a path to get there, to be taking on massive clients for massive scopes, but it always starts in terms of the quickest path there is just to find some specific thing in that broader strategy that other people aren't doing well, that there's a big need for. Um, so I was just talking to somebody who she is a, and this is a little different industry, but she's like a, a relationship coach. So she works with people that are dealing with relationship issues. And one of her types of clients and projects that she's been really successful on is helping founders. So the relationship dynamic between two co-founders that are having relationship issues and like no one's branding themselves as like a co-founder coach. coach. Yeah. And so like, even if she wants to become like the biggest relationship coach in the world and like counseling some of like the most, you know, Jay-Z yeah, and Beyonce yeah, yeah. or something like that, like the path is just like, what's your, I guess like wedge to get in the door in terms of seen as an expert. And then the bigger you get, you can broaden out. Yeah. So for me, it's like, if I wanted to build the biggest digital marketing agency that did social media, that did website development, that did content, that did all kinds of things, I still think like something starting with something like link building to where like, there's a huge need, a lot of people wanted it, not a lot of people were good at it, getting good at that, and then broadening out is way easier than just starting out as a big, broad, nice, all encompassing kind of Makes target sense. audience. Just a follow up question to that. Um, when someone's doing a digital marketing agency, I feel like there's a lot that goes into that from SEO, um, websites, link building, and there's a lot of like aspects to a digital marketing agency. Mm -hmm. How much of a digital marketing agency is like raw skill versus just having really good SOPs? and this is probably from my naive understanding, mm -hmm. all these things are solved problems. Like nothing in this space is, oh, I gotta go innovate and build a solution, right? Yep. Versus there's strategies for SEO, there's strategy for website backlinking. Like there's, I wanna say figured out and solved strategies. It's just a matter of what's your approach and how do you do X, Y, Z yeah. facet of it. So how much of it is about having the right SOPs and strategies versus understanding who your customer is and what they need. Yeah, uh, I can only talk from my experience. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so yeah. like for me, like building quality links from like top websites, so like university sites, government sites, top publications, that was what was the best sales pitch and what people shared when they were referring people to us is like they can get those kinds of links and so, I mean, in terms of like getting clients, like those, that edge in terms of tactics and strategy was a big deal. But as you said, like the SOPs, that's what turns it from me being just a one-off consultant to it being like a potentially like an eight figure business. So they're just two different pieces of the pie. You kind of need both, but they're just, they're serving different purposes. Nice, I like that. Yeah. Going back to your journey, you said you, 2x prices, scale down your team, you're now making more money than you were previous couple of years. Mm -hmm. What was a big turning point after that? Was there one deal that sort of changed their trajectory? Was it just stuff you were setting in motion? But what was one pivotal moment after you made that change? Yeah, so started hiring remote, didn't have the office after a couple of years in Gainesville, and I moved to Orlando, and I, found this thing happening on the internet where I noticed that journalists and blog writers would always start off their articles where 
if it's like a news story or something, they would cite some kind of statistic. So let's say like a, a CNBC writer is basically talking about like oh, the student loan debt problem is growing in the United States. Like in that first paragraph, that'd be like, you know, the total amount of student loan debt in the United States is like $1.6 trillion now. And they would link to some kind of source of data. And like for my background, just did like, like link building was my, my thing. I'm always looking at just how websites link to each other, looking at all this different stuff. And so I noticed this behavior and and historically, everything we've ever done as an agency was we would email a website asking them to get a link. And you know, some of them would give us links, some of them would not. But every link was like we had to go out and chase, just like you know, every kind of content partnership, anything like that. This behavior was looking like a journalist was Googling for some piece of data, finding the first thing that looked like a good source and using that in their article. So I was noticing this and we created this like experimental website where we just created like a like a honeypot of like okay. data and statistics around a given topic. And we noticed within like six months to a year, it was just exponentially exploding in terms of picking up links. We got links from like like a couple dozen times from the New York Times, like independently. Uh, we it culminated, we eventually got a link from a White House press release. Nice all from this like honeypot statistic website that we launched. So the next evolution of the agency was going from doing a ton of email outreach to also adding on a whole new side of the business, which is around content development for these data pieces that would hopefully pick up links naturally from journalists Googling yeah. for stuff. So the big turning point was just a new tactic, a new strategy that, that I identified, and then we built like a whole separate team around it to capitalize on that Makes so sense. yeah when starting out sort of this honeypot content online publishing side of your business how did you approach what to put or were you just creating different publications for different trends you saw different statistics you saw yeah and how are you sort like are you just going research papers or like what was your strategy to get the right because get the right statistic because you can't just do any like you also yeah. need like some source some verified source right so i would basically brainstorm of like okay let's say in a given industry let's say you are in the office supplies category yeah and i would just be trying to think of like okay what content related to office supplies is there like data out there that lots of journalists and lots of bloggers like to cite so for example like maybe it's how often ink cartridges get recycled Maybe it's only like 9% of the time or yeah. something like that. And so what I would do is I would Google just like, uh, how often are ink cartridges recycled? And then if the websites that showed up at the top of Google for those searches have a ton of links, I can investigate them to see like, does it look like what I think is happening is happening? Does it look like all of those links are just like clearly just statistic references in these articles. They're not branded. Yeah. It looks like this behavior is happening. Or if I Google how often ink cartridges get recycled and like no websites that show up at the top of Google have any links, then I know like this is probably not happening. Because if yeah. you're a journalist, you're Googling for this data point, yeah, yeah, yeah. no one has links, that's just not happening. Yeah. So for me, we never took like risks at all in terms of like, if we put out a piece of content on this data point or these sets of data points, would journalists pick it up and link to it if we ranked, if we ranked highly for it, which is which was never like that much of an issue. So yeah, and like for example, on like the student loan debt example, so like one of like the experimental, the experimental website that we launched was around like student loans and paying for college. So like when we launched a page on like the average cost of college per year and how that's changed over time, when we launched that, we knew that if we showed up in the top spot, which wouldn't be hard, we would, based off of all historical linking activity, based off all previously written articles on the internet that generally use this statistic, about 40, 35 to 40 of them per month would be written trying to use that yeah. statistic. And if we rank number one, we'd probably get half of those. Yeah. So when we launched that page, we basically already knew like in the bag, we would get like 20 links a month if we just put out this one piece. Yeah. Now for some other industries, it's like it could be just two links a month and that's worth putting the piece out there. But every single thing we do, whereas like if you think about like PR type campaigns, a lot of creative agencies that put out these pieces and they try to get it into a big publication and then they hope it goes viral. 
all they can really guarantee is that initial placement. They're like, all right, we have like a contact at yeah. Forbes. We know we can put this piece out there. They'll cover it. But from there, they have no yeah. clue what's going to happen. Yeah. Whereas every single piece that we put out there, we knew with like a 90 to 95% certainty exactly the range, the number of links per month that we would get new every single month because journalists write the same articles every single month. Journalists aren't creative. Bloggers aren't creative in terms of that like that basic beginner level. Yeah, yeah, like there's yeah. obviously there's experts and yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. but like we're talking about like, you know, there's a local Fox correspondent at every news station across the country and they all write a lot of the same articles and we can basically predict that like 10 of them are going to like like, write a piece I, about the student loan problem and they would like in eight of them would use the either the average amount of student loan debt per, per student in the United States or the total outstanding debt like they would all use like two of the same statistics so it was pretty easy to predict nice yeah so you spin off this online publishing side of the business what's the business model behind that side of the business so you you're spending time creating content you have writers you it's taking your time and money to spin up these sites. Yeah. These sites are now gaining links based on your strategic placement of what are we going to write a content piece about? Mm -hmm. How does that translate to more revenue for the agency? Yeah, so that experimental site was more of that's never produced revenue, but that was like a way to prove to future clients that we could do this, that we could pull it off, that we literally built it. We had other websites that we owned that were just affiliate websites that we would tack this content onto. So for example, one of the websites was in the property management space and we'd be trying to rank for terms around like lease agreements and different laws in different states and refer people to different products and services for landlords. But one section of the site was all of this like data content. Got it. So we would just tack it on as a subfolder on the site and that would get a bunch of links and then that would help the entire domain as a whole rank better. So, and then those, yeah, those are just pure affiliate websites. So everything that we owned was always like affiliate or lead gen. I never did e-commerce because there's so many other parts of like a successful e-commerce website that just the traffic. Whereas like affiliate and lead gen, it was like 70, 80% of the success of the it's business just was just traffic. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice. How long does it take? Like, let's say you're spinning up these sites, putting uh, content pieces out, creating properties. How long would it take you to start ranking and get to the first page when you know like that's going to happen? Yeah, for general content that we're trying to monetize or the or the content the data content. Either I was both about. and or yeah. The data content would actually go pretty quickly. Okay. So we've noticed that like for certain kinds of like in-depth content type keywords that like as long as you have like a longer more detailed article like you can outrank some of the best websites. And if it's fresher and more up to date like We've seen websites with 100 total links to their domain outranking websites with tens of thousands of links just because their page is a year or two fresher, twice as long. For the general like money, money keywords, money type content, yeah. things we're trying to monetize, anything product service wise, SEO wise would usually take you know a year or two for it okay. to really get it get it get a good chance. So a lot longer for and that. The reason stuff. the reason I ask is a lot of folks. I think get into doing SEO, wanting stuff to happen in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And they're like, hey, one month, two months. And I'm like, I know, like, even for my agency, I have an SEO guy in India. Like, let's just keep doing things. I know it's going to take a while. I don't want this to be immediate ROI. Yeah. I want to start doing the right things with the right intentions. Maybe two years down the line, something happens three years down the line. Yeah. But I think people just have this very wrong assumption of, like, oh, we're gonna start SEO today and like you'll rank in two weeks. I'm like, you may not even get indexed and yeah. indexing also will have random issues that I'm I'm very unaware, you know this more than better than I do, but it just I think people's assumptions are very off just because they don't know better. Most people that come to me that ask for 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 help or guidance, I'm like based off of your where you're at with your business and the expectations that you have for when you need to see results. I, w I wouldn't even mess with SEO. I'd be like, set it, set your website up to be indexed well. Yeah. Like, just do all of the basic stuff. But like the link building stuff that I do, all this massive content development projects, especially with like, you know, generative AI that's just gonna right. totally, Kill totally up. make all this content stuff irrelevant in like five years. Um, I'm just like, don't like, just do the basics and then work on other marketing channels. To be honest. 
So you spin off all these online sites. You know how to rank a site. You're doing well. Agency's doing well. Why not spin up your own content properties? And I think you were, but mm -hmm. why not go double down deeper on that? Because just from my understanding of service versus product, if you have the skill set in a team, would it not be more lucrative to go the affiliate lead gen content marketing route and monetize that versus get clients and keep doing it for them? Or am I missing something in this? That's exactly what I did. And that's exactly what I told every other agency owner as I was doing it. Um, yeah, uh, there was from the span of like basically 2018 to like 20, 21, 2022, like my main focus was on our websites that we were building okay. building out. Cause yeah, those were assets versus yeah. just contracts. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly what it did actually. Yeah. And the reason I ask is I think something I've been telling myself for the past year and a half, two years is distribution and eyeballs matter a lot more in the long run than whatever business I'm currently working on. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it took me a while. And I'm not a, I'm not a big put myself out there. I'm not a big social media person. This is probably the most out there thing I do, which is the podcast, putting myself online. Mm -hmm. But I feel like over the past year, two years after COVID, having distribution, I think is very important. Mm. And that's what I mean, anyone, any founder who comes to me, I'm like, alongside you building your company, do also start build some sort of personal brand because you can build a successful business without a brand. I feel like having a brand makes whatever you do in life easier Yeah, to some capacity. Totally. And again, traffic eyeballs are more of an asset than, than a liability. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So you're building the content marketing side out. Um, are you shut, have you shut down the service side? Do you not do the service side anymore? Or like it's a mix? And we have a couple it's... like legacy clients, but we haven't taken on any new work in like three years. Okay. So as long as we have some clients that, that pay well and we have the right team already built Input. out and that team's pretty happy, we haven't like lost a single person on it in like a few years. So uh, overall, it's just uh, pretty turnkey at this point. So Nice. Yeah. And you ended up selling the business, right? Um, I mean, I tell people like, cause for all intents and purposes, it's none of my time anymore. Yeah. And I've gotten the financial outcome that I've wanted to, but we still have a couple, again, legacy projects in the okay. background. So nice. yeah. Pretty cool. Do you still own the online properties or? Yes. Nice. Yes. Pretty cool. They're all pretty passive at this point. So. So why do you go from that to starting Tiny Talks? What's that journey look like? What was that transition? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's got financial goals with their business. I think everyone's doing it so that they can do other stuff in life. And I basically got to a point where I'm like, this has made enough money where I'm ready for what's next. And I spent a couple of years trying to figure out what was next. I was actually like in a huge state of flux because I had always told myself, I'm gonna build this business so that I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And then I never thought about what, what I wanted I want. to do. Yeah. yeah. And I was, and I wasn't moving the goalposts anymore. I was like, this is, it's done everything. I don't need to like scale this thing, build out a bunch more sites, trying to turn these into like nerd wallet type plays. And uh, yeah, at one point I was, there's a curling rink that's actually like told, a, a yeah. block from here. It's yeah. literally like right here. It's, yeah. uh, I could walk to it. And so yeah, I got really into curling. I was like training and playing in a league and I was like researching the path to the Olympics and realizing that, uh, because there's no money in curling and because people need to travel, it really whittles down the competition. And I was like, that'd be fun to, to really go hard at. So I was doing that for, for like Curling's almost- Curling's a team sport, right? Like it's not just- Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. It's like a four person team. Yeah. And, but they, over COVID, they, clo they turn it into a skating rink. And so then curling on it was like basically throwing a baseball on a hurricane. Yeah. Like you couldn't get better at it if you couldn't be uh, fine tuning your, yeah. your form and stuff. So then the next thing I got really into was producing electronic music, nice. I was working with a producer that was training me um, several hundred hours for a few months and was enjoying that. But then this idea for this event had been sort of simmering for about five years. There's, there's another event series called Pacha Kacha I that uh, they, they're not very big. The basically, TED Talks build out like a super scaled model of local speaking events around the world. Okay. This one is one ten thousandth of yeah. the, the, the notability, but basically they do like short presentations for designers. And 
I went to an event. I was like really inspired by just like uh, sort of what they done, but I wanted to really bring it out to a much broader audience. And I also wanted to like way expand the format to what they were doing. Um, and so as I was sort of seeking for like, what was my next passion? I was like, I would love to hear what other people are passionate about. And so that also matched with the fact that I had always worked online and I was tired of not interacting with people and not having something I could really talk about with other people because no one wants to hear about SEO, like fucking nobody. Uh, and so all those things combined to where like, okay, what if I started this event where I could hear people talk about what they're passionate about in person and I could use my marketing skills in a way that I could gain leverage on this. And I could also just build something genuinely unique that we haven't seen before in terms of uh, just taking some good things from other speaking events like Ted, uh, like Pachaka Cha, there's the moth is another one that inspired me. So I just think like not enough people come together in person and really talk about 100%. what they're passionate about and, and, and sharing stories. Like it's great you do this podcast and you can ask those right questions and you can get stuff out of people, but I don't feel like we share enough in terms 100%. of I agree. really what goes on, on uh, underneath our brains and whatnot. So yeah, I did our, our, our first event in September of last year in 2023 and we just held our fourth event, uh, a week and a half ago yeah, yeah and it's been going really we're we're right now hunting for a new venue because like we keep growing and faster than expected so we're now nice. gonna how many folks did came out for the last event we had 200 and we nice. sold out a couple days before nice That's so cool. we had a bunch of people show up to try to get tickets at the door so it was uh it was a little crazy so yeah but it's going well nice what's what's next for tiny talk what's the next event or it's not planned yet it's so right now looking for another venue I hopefully have a phone call today with somebody that that potentially goes you well. You need for two hundred people. Three hundred seated. Three hundred seated with some okay. extra space for people to hang out and. Okay. And I have an idea for a space. I'll. I'll okay. um, but it's right in front of ACC. I really like the space. It doesn't have seats, but you can put chairs. Um, I'm pretty sure you can fit three hundred there. And there's like a small bar area, Ooh. and it's right next to like an empty lot on Fourth Street. So like people can hang out like in the backyard sort of thing. Pretty cool spot. I, I really like it. Maybe 300 is pushing it. I don't know, but I, I, I can send you that info. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would love that. Uh, why did you, are you just sick of doing online stuff? Do you not do anything on the internet? And like, I mean, you probably do, but like from the point of view of tiny talks is a very in-person collaboration, like yeah. setting versus, an SEO content set. Like these seem like two very different extremes. Yeah. Are you just done with internet stuff or you want to do something? Not done. I mean, I still spend most of my time working on a laptop, <laughs> working on, on the event and all the branding and the design and the video yeah. editing. So like, yeah. I'm not escaping it complete, completely. I, I think one thing that really got at me as as a founder of a SEO agency, as a, as a link building consultant, which, you know, some people listening might still have just heard link building for the first yeah, time. Yeah. I had girlfriends that didn't know really what I did. Yeah. Cause no one wanted to hear. Not even not even the person that was in a relationship really wanted to hear in the weeds details of what I did. So it was really frustrating where I would spend so much of my time and energy pouring myself and my mind into these things and thinking about them and then just like so few people like gave a shit. Yeah. And so one big thing that I wanted to do is I wanted my next thing to be something that I could talk about that people actually wanted to hear about so that I could actually like share what I was working on with the world and not have to just keep it all in my brain and just to those like client calls, like that was just so intellectually frustrating. So a big part of this was, I love getting to talk about my events and I love getting to talk about what I'm spending my time on. I love getting to like share about like, what are the, the, the past talks that were big hits? What are the kind of talks that I'm like looking to get people to do? dynamics around just like getting people to interact at an event like i really want people to come and actually make friends at my event and not just show up sit down watch talks and go home yeah. and all of these things that i get to think about are like invited in conversations that people want to hear about 100%. it so i mean that was one big element and then yeah the other big element was just yeah like interacting in person i think everyone at this point has seen the statistics about the reduction in social connections that we've okay. had over the last few decades. I just watched this documentary about this, this guy wrote this book called Bowling Alone that came out in like the 80s or 90s or something like that. And he was just basically dissecting statistics about how since like the 1960s, 
people have just come together and done clubs and groups and organizations and communes to a much lesser degree and it's gotten way worse since then and so just seeing that and realizing that after I'd hit my financial goals, the only thing that was like tangible that I felt like would add a lot of value that was really worth pursuing was for me meeting more people and connecting with more people. And so this is just like a a thing that sits between like five different dynamics in my life that 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 really scratched a lot of different itches at once. So I like that. I think there was a statistic I read where I think the current Gen Z or whoever the latest generation is is not dating as much and not going out as much as what we were doing when we were in high school. Yeah. And it's concerning because it leads to a lot of other issues, loneliness, friendship, like just social anxiety. You don't know how to take care of yourself in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to become a problem. It may not be apparent right now, but I feel like because of social media addiction, doom scrolling, People are just glued to their phones. Like when you don't know what to do, you take your phone out and you start scrolling because yeah. it's dopamine, right? And I feel like that's just going to cause, I don't know what kind of problems, but I feel like it's going to not have a good impact. It was weird. So like the, yeah, this documentary just basically broke down as like, it's already causing problems, but all these like subtle ways that aren't like a, a, like easily peaceable back, you know, you could be like, all right, we got a smoking problem and we can see there's a lot of lung cancer. It's like, okay, it's very easy to show that it's a problem when it's so direct. Yeah. Whereas like, Having less friends and less social connections creates a lot of problems that are like murky in terms of yeah. piecing it back. Yeah. So I think it already is like a huge problem. I think it's like, I think mental health is a bigger thing more than ever. I think if you just don't have people you can talk to and, and do things with, I 100%. think like that's one of the clearest direct examples, but I think there's a lot of other repercussions yeah. in like every area of society. I think on the other side, like there's a little bit of, like light at the end of the tunnel. I was reading this documentary about some Twitch streamer who would just stream to no audience, but then she ended up joining some Discord. And now her best friends are like these four random people on Discord mm. that she's met up with and they've actually built a friendship. It happened because they were all introvertish. They didn't know how to go outside. They didn't mm. know how to talk and make friends. They just ended up on this Discord channel together and became the best of friends. And so oh. I think there is like, some side to it, but also that's probably such a small percentage that. Dude, so the the one friend I had when I moved to Austin, uh, super close friend, I met him on Twitter. So we were both tweeting about SEO stuff back in the day. We met up at a conference. So like, I mean, there's a lot of good things about yeah. the internet bringing people together. Like it happens. I'm sure we all have seen some of those like sweetheart videos yeah. of people meeting, you know, through like e gaming you know the, and. You know the latest trending hashtag on like Twitch and TikTok and stuff? Huh? Hope Core. Hope core. Yeah. Um, someone made a post on LinkedIn that also blew up. But it's basically this guy, this, the video that went viral was this guy's Twitch streaming to no one. And Pudgy, Pudgy Penguins was a crypto NFT token. Mm -hmm. And they're going to the streamers like, oh, it's my birthday. No one's saying me happy birthday today. And this Twitch streamer starts singing him happy birthday. Mm. And then they donate him 500 bucks. And he's like, I don't want to do that for you. And the guy had some medical issues, lost his job. So he's just trying to figure shit out. Oh, and wow. then Pudgy Penguins made that post on TikTok and everything. And that guy went from 100 followers on Twitch to now he has over 300K Holy followers. God. And like f tens of plus thousand people are watching his Twitch stream. And he's, and it's called, it's called Hope Core. But I mean, it's been popping off lately for the past week or two. Wow. And so like there's that side of the internet as well. But yeah. I feel like that's such a small it's percentage small percent. yeah. <laughs> of like the reality of what exists. But, totally. Yeah. I mean, still, it's still, it's still like touch, oh, like happy go lucky kind of feeling. Yeah. Right? It's a tool. It, everything, everything's a tool. Yeah. It's just being used for bad more than it is for good. Yeah. I think one thing I wanted to ask, you were mentioning you met your financial goals and you don't have to say a number, but for entrepreneurs listening, how do you figure out where to stop your goalposts? Because I think this is a very common problem with entrepreneurs and just folks who are building their own businesses. The goalpost keeps moving. It's yep. always the next goal in that. So what led you to decide, hey, that's it. This is my number. This is what I want to do. I'm going to not focus on grinding more. Because I think it's very hard, very easy for people to get lost in that vicious cycle of, okay, like just a little bit more. Let me go this, this goal, that goal, whatever, right? Yeah. How did you figure that out what what caused that i mean i will say like the biggest driving force and i you know i wanted to make a billion dollars when i was like 20 like i was literally like 
I knew exactly how old Zuckerberg was when he was a billionaire. Yeah. I was like, okay, I still got a few years. So like, and at that point, it was just like ego and pride was the first driving factor. And I think ego is a very useful thing. Like, it, it can be a lot, it can be very negative, but like, yeah. you can also get people to get their best work out of themselves. But at a certain point, once I was just like making good money and I was just being smart with it, I was saving it all. And I realized like I wasn't really that motivated to like keep pushing and growing when if I made two times as much money, I would just put it in a savings account. And so I had just sort of this like come to Jesus moment of just like, okay, what am I gonna actually spend this money on? Yeah, 100%. And because it's like, if I'm gonna keep getting motivated to keep growing this thing, I need to know what I'm getting out of it. And for me, I didn't want to fly private or have a house in the Hamptons. You know, there's certain people towards like, they really want that. For whatever reason, they really want those things. And they think it's worth like grinding another three or four years out of their life to get it versus being financially free. For me, it wasn't. I was basically like, once I can travel where I want to, I can be comfortable, I can have total freedom to do what I want when I want to do it, and and basically be at that point for essentially the rest of my life. As long as I don't totally screw up, like just investing my money and making you know five to ten yeah, percent yeah, per yeah. year, uh, then generally speaking, that's the point I wanted to get to. Yeah. And so once I realized I was there, then. I just basically was like, I've lost motivation to make a few million dollars more when just essentially, I have no idea what I would do with it. I don't know what I don't have at this point or, would, or that I could get that would actually be worth spending years of my time. And so, but I honestly think, I, I think that's a super logical argument, but the more entrepreneurs I talk to, honestly, I think it's like an identity thing. I think like once you're so wrapped up in your business and this is all you're like programming yourself to do, it's so hard to get off that train. I mean, we see it with like NFL quarterbacks that don't know how to retire. Tom Brady, Brett Favre, there's a lot of guys that just like they don't know what else to do because the last 15 years, 20 years, that's all they've ever done. And that's their lane. That's what they know. That's what that's they're good lane. at. Yeah. And once you exceed, it's hard to go to something and just be shitty at it. Yeah. Right. Like it's very hard for someone to. Oh, like I was a quarterback. Let me just go try golfing yeah. and suck at golfing. And then people are like, how am I not the top 1% yeah. because he performed? And I 100% agree that. It Especially is. when you're getting so much, like you get, you come on this podcast, Avi's like, we want you as a guest. You know, you're a founder, like you've accomplished all these things. Like you get so much outside validation from the business that you founded yeah. and what you're doing. And so to just go away from that, yeah, I think it's identity. So I think, I think that's as much of a factor as it is as people not logically thinking through what they want to do with their money. There's a book I'm like in the middle of right now called Die With Zero. Yeah. That Have you heard that book? Bill Perkins, right? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. You know he lives in Austin. He does. He plays high stakes poker also a bunch. No way. Okay. Um, I love Austin for that reason, man. Yeah. Every, every, every week I find out somebody else is living here. It's so cool. Yeah. So. Okay. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's just... A lot of people like the idea and the opportunity of like, oh, if I make 30 mil, I can do this. Do you really want to do it? Do you need it? You don't know. You haven't answered it. But you like the idea of I want the I want the option to. Yeah. And I think like you said, spend and just reaching a financial level. Uh, there's this group called Hampton, which does like. Uh, just joined. You, you just joined Hampton. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I know someone who used to work there and. What they were telling me was they talked to all these people who are successful. They made a bunch of money. Most of them are spending 20 to 25K a month, maybe 30K a month. And he's like, to spend 30K a month, if you do the back maths, you don't need more than 8 or 9 million or 10 million in the bank. And if you don't want to work and you withdraw the 3 4%, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, that's enough to do 20, 30K spend a month. Mm hmm. So why are you working towards 40, 50, 60, 100 million yeah. when we don't even need it? No. And to your answer, I think people like the idea and they like the thought and they like the validation that comes with it. Yeah. Then no one needs it, yeah. right? Um, but you just don't know better. Yeah. So uh, I do agree with the identity point. You mentioned you really like Tiny Talks and the conversations happening. What's one that stuck out from the three or four that you've done so far? One yeah. talk on stage. I mean, the one that went absolutely viral online, it's got a couple million views on Instagram right now, is uh, I saw this new story a few years ago of this woman in Austin who found a 2,000-year-old Roman statue in a Goodwill. Okay, I think and I've seen this. Yeah, so I saw this new story and I was like, I gotta get her to come tell that story. And so we talked for like six months 
and uh, she was real nervous before coming on stage. Laura, she's incredible. And she goes on stage and she just owns the room in terms of like, she's got a great story, but she crushed it in terms of just being engaging. Yeah. And yeah, it's just this whole story of, she finds this old statue in a Goodwill, she goes to sell it, Sotheby's, identifies it as stolen art I've from World War made. II, and it becomes this whole like international fiasco. She went on like, uh, she was like featured in a BBC story. Uh, I think the Today Show had a piece about her, and she was just everywhere about this like, like this this thing, and like, is she gonna return it? And so she tells this story. It was really incredible. And then at this last event, on my like top ten Austin bucket list, like there are iconic pieces of Austin culture, and I want at some point to get every single person nice. responsible. But one of them from that list was the woman, uh, her name's Amy, who painted the I Love You So Much mural uh, at Joe's Coffee. Yeah, yeah. And so she just told this very emotional story of like painting it and who it was for and what it meant to her and what's it like seeing it everywhere. And it's a little tough story because like she, uh, uh, you'll have to watch the talk, yeah, but yeah. generally speaking, those two really stick out. Nice. So. But there's also, I mean, one of my, uh, somebody I really look up to, uh, his name is Nick Gray. He wrote a book called The Two Hour Cocktail yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah. And I've like thrown events based off of his book. And at our second event, he came and spoke at that. Yes. And he told a story of some of the parties and events that he's thrown. And so like that one was really cool for me of just like somebody I look up to seeing that. But yeah, it's been it's been really fun. Real, a lot of really cool people have agreed to do it so far. So, yeah. Did you see Nick's Twitter Japan thing? Yes. And <laughs> um, uh, I'm a part of like a bunch of random Facebook groups. I opened Facebook the other day. Someone made a post similar. They're like, hey, here's an all expense paid book somewhere in Cabo or Bahamas or something. And it's like some 34 year old entrepreneur. And he, he's like, I want to, I'll pay for everything for someone to go with mm. but you know similar to what nick did on the japan thing for twitter and then <laughs> the th everyone's like how do i know you're not going to kill me how do i know you're not going to do this and then everyone started referencing nick's tweet in that in that thread but yeah very random yeah so, um <laughs> cool that's cool um do you want to run tiny talks as a business a profitable business or just something you're going to do irrespective of whether it actually my goal is for it to not lose money. Okay. So it's it's I've lost a good amount of money on it, but that was always the the plan of like I'm gonna set aside a hundred grand basically to get this off the ground and and get the branding the way I want it done by a top agency to get the speakers I want from day one. So I've paid a lot of the speakers. Eventually, will be hopefully people will be doing it for for no money yeah. at that point once they have a big enough audience. But generally speaking. Um, yeah, this is all. This has always been a passion project, nice. and I do, I do have a vision for the brand to scale it and whatnot. But I don't need it to make money. I don't really want it to make money. I'd rather just keep pouring it back into the business to like sense. make a cooler experience. Because I get a ton at like my return on my investment is exceptional in terms of the people Never I've gotten to meet yeah. and just the overall enrichment of my life that I've gotten from it. So the ROI is there. It's just not financial. Makes sense. Yeah. Just one thing unsolicited recommendation but you said lose money um maybe use the word invest instead of lose and i was talking to someone the other day and i was like i want to spend my time somewhere i want to decide where i spend my time and he's like start thinking about it not by saying the word spend versus invest mm. where do you want to invest your time because spending is a frivolous activity mm -hmm. versus when you start saying okay where do i want to invest my time this podcast meeting someone having a coffee where am I investing my time will change the way I start thinking about, okay, what do I now invest it in versus yeah. I spend my time meeting someone sounds, doesn't sound like it sounds more frivolous. It doesn't have an investment ROI, but just, I've been trying to see what words do I use that I could start using a better word for it to change the dynamic and how I think about it. But yeah, as a, yeah I'm, random, I'm random. gonna, I'm gonna cause when that. you said <laughs> I lose money, I don't want to lose money on it. I was just thinking, Instead of saying lose, if you say, I, I want to invest money to get something, blah, 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 and like just changes how you paint the picture. But hell yeah, it's random. No, thank you for that. Random piece of advice.
that you didn't ask for. <laughs> Sweet. I, I do this thing towards the end of every episode. I have a couple questions and then I'll ask you a last question. What would you say has been your support system in your journey of building your business, tiny talks, everything you want to do? What's been your support system? Yeah, I will say that's probably like the biggest reason I got, I was successful and I was, was the fact that when I started blogging and I went to my first conferences, I was like, I, I had a special wristband at the conference where I wasn't allowed to drink. I was like one of two people at like a thousand person conference that was there, they couldn't drink. And so as this like kid that already had his name out there, I had a lot of people in the, in, in, in the space that, that wanted to give back. And so I got to meet a lot of different agency owners that were very generous with their time and their nice. advice. So just from people within the industry and just connecting with people to where like we could just talk ideas and stuff with on, on the SEO side and then end up being my really good friends. So for me, people that I met online, uh, you know, my, my, my two closest friends come out of it. One, he lives in Mexico, uh, Zef Snap, he runs Altura Interactive and like he's somebody that gave me a ton of advice early on. And then um, Ryan McLaughlin here in Austin, he ran a, uh, an agency called Rise for a while. And so like those two guys were super big, but then also just other uh, a handful of other peers in the SEO space and just not having to learn the same mistakes that they made just by hearing their stories and what they did. So nice. I like that. Yeah. What's your startup tech stack? How do you run tiny talks um, or the agency, whatever you want to talk about? Like what tools are you using? What resources? What project management? Yeah. Top down. Honestly, it's Google spreadsheets, like Google Docs. We're right now doing SOPs for this next event to be a lot more standardized, but generally speaking, uh, I mean, like we use Notion for my agency to do all of our documentation, so we might use that once we kind of get things right. But generally speaking, it's a pretty simple nice. email and Google spreadsheets, like at least at this stage, we're not trying to overcomplicate stuff. If we try to scale to other cities, it's gonna be a very different situation. But like even for our ticketing, we use thing called Ticket Spice. It's just like the cheapest I could find that does like a half decent job at just yeah. doing basic ticketing. Uh, we use Slick Text. It doesn't charge you an arm and a leg. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually very reasonable. Uh, slick Text for our SMS marketing. And I think, that's, I think that's basically it. Nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. What are three resources that you'd recommend to someone listening? three resources that I'd recommend for people listening. I mean, f books, I can just think of a few different Which books. Ones? Yeah. So like Good to Great, I think is one of the most foundational books because it just talks about this basic concept of you've got to find something, I think it's like the, par the porcupine method or something like that, it's got an interesting name. But it's like, if you're trying to figure out like what you're gonna do and spend your time on be really good at, like you need to find something that people value that you're really good at and that you also enjoy. And if you wanna find a successful niche or business or anything, like your best shot is to find something that's all three. So I honestly, I really enjoyed learning how to do link building. People really valued it and I was ten I tended to be good at it. So nice. overall that book is super, super important. Uh, a classic, The 4-Hour Work Week, uh, really talks about just how to get the most out of your time and how not to just work yourself to death in a way that like, it's just being smarter with your time. I think a big takeaway from the book is not necessarily that you wanna work four hours in a week. It's just being like, if you can turn 40 hours into four hours. How do you do that? Then you can scale back up to 40 hours and 10X everything you're yeah, doing. Yeah, 100%. Um, so those two books. I think that's yeah. a very interesting way to look at it. I think a lot of people think about it the other way. They don't think about it, okay, how do I condense and like rebuild? It's just like, yeah. I just wanna do, don't do work, how do I condense and like step? But no, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah. And then the last one I'd say is Atomic Habits. Yeah. Atomic Habits is just absolute. A very few books I've seen online where it's like a perfect five stars with like 5,000 reviews, but that book is incredible. It's timeless. So I'd say between, and that book's just all about just the micro science between how to have good habits in your life for business reasons and personal reasons. And everything is just like prophetic in terms yeah. of just the Do you ever reread any of these books? Yeah, Atomic Habits a couple okay. times. Uh, I, I, th I may have only read those first two books once, but those were like just foundational concepts, whereas right. Atomic Habits actually it gives a lot of specifics and ideas and whatnot. So, okay, cool. Yeah. I like it. Um, 
Also, Tim Ferriss lives in Austin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. Um, I think he's recorded some stuff out of their South Studio. Um, oh, wow. So, if you ever run into him. I've heard he's not the friendliest person when he's caught on the street walking, but... Cool. I've All right, never, I'll confront him with a microphone I've and never been ask him some hard-hitting questions. I have a last question from a previous guest, and then I'll ask you to give me one for my next guest. What's the most interesting thing that you've learned or seen in the past couple weeks, months, most recently? Most interesting thing that I've learned in the past weeks or months? I mean, so I'm going to go back to something I mentioned earlier about the two-hour cocktail party, this book. If anybody likes to... If anyone wants to get more out of their social life and does like networking stuff like that, highly recommend this book. It's very tactical. Yeah. And Nick Gray, the author, he just he picks apart all these little tiny things, like whether or not people should wear name tags. He picks apart things like doing icebreaker questions in a specific like format that makes total sense in terms of gets the most out of people. He even goes to so far as he has a specific idea on if there's a bunch of people talking in a room, how do we get their attention Harmon. without being a total jerk and being very jarring. So he's like, I have a harmonica and our harmonica, it sounds really nice on the ears and it makes people intrigued in terms of what's going on. And so it's his book full of these little things about throwing events and parties and whatnot that like I would have never thought about to the level that he had just because he had so much experience yeah. in throwing them. So I would say, I read that book a year ago and I read, or I threw a handful of these little two hour cocktail parties on my house and it was just a lot of fun. So I would say one of the most interesting things for me was just the dynamics between all these little tiny things to do at events. I like that. Um, I feel like Nick has a different kind of energy and like I've done two hour cocktail parties, but when you go to one that Nick is hosting, I feel like the energy is just on a very different, yeah. like. And up there, I'm not like a very like happy go. I'm not gonna be like bouncing on my feet all the time, but like Nick's energy at his events is just a different level that I don't think I could ever match. But again, <laughs> it creates a different vibe. It creates a different environment, makes people feel more comforting. I think one thing I've seen him do at events that I really like is if there's someone standing in a corner, he very naturally brings them into the circle, introduces mm. them and then fucks off and goes to a different circle but like now this person's like chatting versus they were just standing on the side i think that's something that i've seen him do really well at like, yeah larger events it's just like everyone's just always talking to someone there's i don't think i've ever seen anyone stand alone that he will not go to and pull into some circle so i like i like that he does that yeah yeah he's amazing <laughs> uh what's what's your question for my next guest what is what is a favorite story that you like to share from early on in your entrepreneurial journey? Sweet, no, but I think I am, I thoroughly enjoy the conversation. Thank you for coming on. Where can folks find you? What do you wanna plug? What do we link for you in the description? Who should reach out if they wanna talk on Tiny Talks? What kind of stuff are you looking for? Yeah, uh, the two plugs would just be tinytalks.com and uh, we also have an Instagram page where we post a bunch of content and our, our YouTube page as well, so. Uh, just check out the website. Uh, for right now, I'm handpicking everybody that speaks. Okay. People can totally reach out uh, and they can kind of share with what the kind of story that they have to share, but it would just be like looking at some of the other talks to get an idea of, because the yeah. content, it's not self-help content. It's not, I'm a big leader and let me tell you five tips on how to be a better one. It's more of just people has like a- course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just people with like a generally interesting life experience of something that they really like chased after, or they're passionate about that, that uh, just makes for a really cool story that they are down to give in a PowerPoint presentation. So, nice. Yeah. Sounds good. Sweet. But thank you for coming on. We'll link everything and we should do an episode two in a couple months and see how Tiny Talk's grown and talk more about curling and a baby shark that I didn't get to. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Avi.